This is No Spin Live, and do we have a show for you today? We're going to talk about surgery without consent, the case of the exploded nipple, and plastic surgeons getting plastic surgery. Do they actually do that? And we've got some real great experts to discuss these topics. We've got Dr. Jason Posner from Boca Raton, Florida, Dr. James Nam Noom from Atlanta, Georgia, and Dr. Lee Thornton from Meridian, Mississippi. All right, well, let's get into this first topic. Jason, I'm going to start off with you. This, you know, this is about a, a plastic surgeon who's has some legal proceedings going on for apparently doing, you know, surgery that was not consented for. So, does that does that happen? You know, it, it's in this particular case, I actually know the uh, physician involved, and he was actually a friend of a doctor who used to work here. And you no, know, these things can happen. We have to be very careful about what we do. I mean, I can't tell you pretty much on a weekly basis, I'm with a pre-op patient before taking them in the OR and they say, oh doc, by the way, can you do this while you're there? Well, can you do this while I'm asleep? And the issue is, unless you have consent and discuss it with the patient, you're, it's assault if you're doing something that they did not agree to and you didn't discuss. I mean, Jimmy, the, I mean, we obviously don't have the details, so I'm not sure we can actually comment um, one way or another, but I mean, what's your take on this whole deal? Well, I think, you know, like you said, we don't have the details, so it's really difficult to know what the doctor was thinking. And presumably he was thinking about doing the right thing for the patient, but like Jason said, a lot of times there's 11th hour decision making. And he may have talked to the patients in the preoperative area and not gotten a consent because he's, everyone thought, well, I heard him agree. Yes, they agreed. Yes, we talked about doing this. But unfortunately, for everybody concerned, unless you have really documented it and read through everything, these 11th hour decisions are problematic. What's your insights into maybe patients that are seeing this and worried that that's going to happen to them? Well, we certainly hope that it's rare. And uh, again, I'll reiterate, we don't know the details of this case. I don't know what is on that consent. So uh, hopefully there was consent and, and uh, pretty clear cut. Uh, if not, of course, this is a problem. I think this is a very black and white area. Um, you've got to have consent. You have to have discussed it with the patient. Um, that, that's all there is to it. Now, one thing that I will tell you that we've instituted here several years ago, and we really go by the checklist system. You know, it's like a pre-flight check for, uh, for an airliner taken off. And we often have patients in our pre-operative room, whether we're removing a lesion or whether we're doing a cosmetic case, they may ask for something more. We always have our pre-op nurse in there. If we do make a decision, immediately it's put on the consent. That consent follows the patient to the operating room. We check again before we start the procedure. These are the things that we're doing, and we limit it to that. All right, well, this, those are some great insights. I'm sure probably maybe this is probably not the last time we're gonna talk about this case, because I'm sure there'll be more to it. But um, all right, let's go on to the next story. Uh, it's so funny, reading the headline, I was thinking, count the red flags here, botched. Sugar Queen's fourth boob job leaves her with one nipple twice the size of the other. Okay, so. A lot to talk about here. What's what's the deal here, Jason? So this is a case in which case a lady has some overfilled saline implants to the point beyond manufacturer's recommendations. Okay. I don't consider that that's bad, but not too bad because I've been involved in some of those cases in the past. The question is, she had a circumareolar mastopexy and one of the sutures broke and one areola was bigger than the other. That's how I understood the case. And now she doesn't want to fix them because it might involve changing the size of the implants or or other such thing and so now she has some asymmetric breasts so that's basically the story as i understand it so simple solution to me would be okay pop the pop the suture holding the smaller areola problem solved you have two symmetrical large areolas i got that but in this case she the story went about you had to decrease the size of the implant and such and to fix that areola properly, you'd probably have to take out some of the stretch in that implant and put a decrease the size and then fix it and then blow it up later. So I think this patient's a little crazy and a little attention seeking. And uh, if it was my boob, I'd probably hide them. To me, she would actually do herself a favor going down in size, it looks like to me. And I'm sure that is part of the problem. But I mean, what do you think about this whole deal? Well, I mean, there's so many things wrong with this case that it's, it's hard to know where to begin. You know, the implants that are too long are much too large for a patient. 
a, a mastopexy that's the wrong breast lift operation to do. And then this, the, her goal was to get to 2,000 cc implants. I don't know about you, but nobody makes 2,000 cc implants. So to Jason's point, you're widely outside the boundary of what is appropriate for the patient given her physique. And now you're taking implants and so you're going widely outside the boundary of what's right for the implants and it's the wrong kind of breast lift. And, and it, you know, there's so many things that are wrong with this case. It's hard to know where to begin. But like Jason said, I mean, you obviously, in someone who had better judgment, you would put in a smaller device and downsize her implants and take the stress off her mastopexy or you'd convert them to a circumvertical mastopexy. And that would be the right thing to do. Uh, Dr. Thornton, I don't know. He, I, he may be sure Queen showed up in his waiting room. He had to run off, but he maybe he's having technical difficulties. But, you know, um, the one thing is, is that there is this obsession with these patients. I, I mean, this is not about this story, but I just, we can talk about it like with just size and, they just want to be bigger, but God, it's just, it's, I mean, I'm sure you both you guys see some of these things. It's just, it's difficult to, I mean, you look at this picture, so it's like, to me, it's, it's natural that, or it's obvious that she needs to be smaller in size, but she doesn't think that. And that's a difficult situation because those people have a lot of problems. And it's not just breast implants. I mean, how many patients that you see for lip augmentation, they come in, they want bigger, bigger. I'm like, no, stay away. Your lips are too big. Or, or they get in this filler obsession where I'm like, you're on filler holiday, you know, for a few months, let it calm down or even dissolve some of it and start again. People keep looking in the mirror and don't know what they're seeing, I think. And I think that's a big part of the problem. We all wish Sugar Queen the best of luck and hopefully, uh, she can get what she, she wants. So, all right, well, let's move on to the last story. And uh, still missing Dr. Thornton, technical difficulties. Maybe he'll be joining us. But the question is, do plastic surgeons get actual plastic surgery procedures on themselves? So previous to last week, okay, I've done Botox fillers. I've done a bunch of lasers. I've had cool sculpting, other non-surgical fat. I've had the new BTL device. I actually had a little gynecomastia excised um, a number of years ago, fibrous, but and it was painful. But that's fine. But this is my first foray into real cutting cosmetic surgery. I had a little downtime in my schedule due to a canceled trip, and I got tired of looking at my lids. So I had one of my uh, partners, Dr. Alan Gold. He did my upper and lower eyelids. Um, today's Tuesday, a week ago, Monday. Upper bluff, lower pinch, plus fat out, plus a laser of my lower lids. And I did it exactly the same way I do my patients. I got a 75 of Demerol, one Ativan, and I did Pronox, okay? Nitrous oxide, no general, no YV sedation. I didn't feel a damn thing throughout the whole case. I took one Vicodin the night of surgery because I thought it would help me sleep. But other than that, no pain meds. It was nothing. I couldn't stand looking at myself anymore. I was looking at patients telling them they needed eyelid surgery and they'd look at me and said, you needed more than me, doc. When are you going to do yours? So I took the plunge and I got to tell you, I learned a few things though on like cleaning and other things and how to prepare the patients better. But one of the things I, I can tell you though is I'm gonna to talk to the patients a little bit differently now because I can tell you, I knew what I was experiencing. I knew that if I had a pain or a swelling or a little pull down, what was going on, but I could understand where the patients would be a little scared about something that wasn't perfect immediately and be on the internet looking up Dr. Google and trying to figure things out themselves. But I knew that, I knew what I was going through. So I think it was a good learning experience for me and hopefully I don't look as bad as I did before surgery. You know, I, I think that Jason really nailed it. Most plastic surgeons do non-invasive plastic surgery, if you want to call it minimal surgical plastic surgery. Those that are in the know, like Jason, probably opt for non-general anesthesia if they're going to do something like their eyelids. I think a lot of uh, men probably have fewer, as Jason said, cutting operations. I think some of our female compa compatriots are more likely to have had uh, operations that we would more traditionally do on our patients. But as the techniques get better, as you are, as we're able to better discern ways to ameliorate pain and to manage the whole experience, I think we'll see more of our docs, male docs, getting, you know, the kind of cutting plastic surgeon that Jason got. So I think we're going to see more of it, Billy. I think that techniques get better, and as they get better, doctors are more inclined to have things done because they see it. What do you think? I think it's it makes total sense. You know, if if 
if you're not willing to do a procedure or do have a treatment that you're going to offer on your patients, that doesn't make sense. So I, I uh, but I, I agree. I think non-surgical is much more common, but there are surgical procedures people are doing. You know, Jason, I was going to say no spin live. Yeah, it's been, the patients watch this and we get so much email and messaging and how the insights you guys are providing people really like, but it's helped you even. Look, if you didn't watch yourself on No Spin Live, you wouldn't have this surgery. And now look, you look 20 years younger. We, we couldn't even like, we couldn't even tell it was you. Especially that right eye. Now. <laughs> Especially I'm gonna that laser right my eye. scars too. My, when I, when, once I, another week or so, the scars are getting lasered because that really helps. Yeah, I was, just, I was gonna say, I, I totally agree with those insights about the learning and the being able to talk to patients. And with that in mind, I'm happy to put breast implants in either of you guys at any time, just let me know. <laughs> and that way you'll be able to talk to your breast implant patients with a new light. Our viewers, I'm sure, enjoyed it. And if you wanna see more of this, you can see it on the plasticsurgerychannel.com.